Welcome back everyone to Showing Off. This is a series of three videos about Civilization V. This video is about options and world setup. If you would like to see gameplay or if you'd like to see my commentary, I'll put links to the other two videos along the side here in the annotations. So you can go check those out if you're interested in them instead. But for now, let's begin with uh, the options. So the options menu in Civilization V, as you can see, contains quite a lot, and it's more detailed than the options from Alpha Centauri were. But some of them are a little weird, so we're going to go through each of these. You'll see that there's four different tabs, and we'll start right here on the Game Options tab. Now each of these options have a little tooltip that comes up, you can see there. Blah blah blah, I'm going through those very quickly. That's the pull point. Nom 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 nom. Okay, and uh, there's a couple, there's a slider and some other things. Both of these are just little checks. So we start with automated workers don't replace existing improvements. If you automate something, will it replace an existing improvement? For example, let's say you have a farm somewhere, uh, maybe it will replace it with a better farm. Yes or no? And of course here, automated workers don't remove features like forests, jungle, or marshes except when improving a strategic or luxury resource. So these both deal with automated workers, and generally I keep these checked, uh, but you might not. You might, you know, you might want automated workers to do the best they can. Uh, no, no reward pop-ups. Disables reward pop-ups, technology, ancient ruins, etc. So when you find something in the game, you want it to pause the game, uh, pop up a little message in the center saying, hey look, something happened. Yes or no? Um, it's an efficiency thing. No tile recommendations. This labels on map recommendations when settlers or workers are selected. And notice I have this checked because I don't like the computer doing that. Just like I don't like the computer making these decisions for me. However, if you're a very casual gamer, you might want those recommendations. Civilization is intended to be a much more casual game than Alpha Centauri was. Uh, and that's reflected in the game setup, as we'll see in a little bit later on. Display yields for civilian units. So display unmapped yield information when civilian units are selected. If you select a unit, as in not a military unit, and then generally there's only like two. There's the settlers um, and the workers who build things. Then do you want, when you select them, do you want to see all the yield? Yes or no? If I've said no, I'm going to see yields other ways. And no basic tooltip help condenses many game tooltips to just the raw information, removing explanatory help. So if you want that, then uh, you, you don't get the tooltips. If you want the tooltips, keep this off then. You'll see that I've left the tooltips off. Map info delay. So if you look at the map and you hover your cursor over a tile, something will come up about that tile. Do you want it to come up uh, sooner or later? Like zero seconds, it'll be there automatically. This is pretty much zero seconds. I'm not spending any time. Um, the default is one second so that you can move your thing over, but if you want to actually see something, you have to let it sit there and wait. So as you can see, these are not actually, you know, these are all set to zero, pretty much. So I have it set to two. Uh, I'm not sure if I like that or not. I think 1.5 would be better, but I don't know if this slider actually has, like, why is it a slider? Advisor level. Amount of advice you receive from your advisors. Huh, imagine that. This is a uh, drop-down menu. So, there's several different things. Um, are you new to the Civilization series? In which case, you'll want to know everything about it. The advisors will come up all the time with a little box right up here and say, Hey, I think blah blah blah, and this is what's going on. And that's, you know, they'll give you a little explanation there. Um, and, and they'll do it for everything. New to Civ 5 means only for th things that are new to this game. So if you've played the other civilizations, there are things that are new to this game or different from the others. New to the expansion. Uh, the Currently you saw earlier it said Gods and Kings, and that's an expansion pack off of the stuff. Well, are you new to the expansion? Maybe you played Civ 5 but not Civ 5 Gods and Kings and you want to know how religion works. Are you an experienced player and you need only very little advice, just like reminders or nothing? I've picked new to Civ 5 since I've played other Civs, um, but I'm finding that most of their advisor levels, most of their advice is kind of annoying. However, I would still recommend that most people look at it unless you are 
an experienced player or just new to the expansion, in which case you might not need them. And you probably know how to access that information anyways. If you're a person who never played this at all, you might not know how to access all the information. And so that's what the advisors are there for. Um, currently, I've turned off a lot of advisor messages, so this button will reset them so that they come back on. And I should probably do that at some point. So, there we go. See, I made my promise. Single player auto in turn. Um, I always leave this off, and even in Alpha Centauri, um, you know that it always goes turn complete. Well, there's no voice here, but the same thing. Do you want it to just keep going on and on and on, or not? And there, there are pros and cons to either side. Multiplayer auto in turn, same thing. Um, I think though that this, the the difference here is that. In multiplayer, you have to wait for everybody to end their turn, and then do you all have to click an end turn button, or does it just go to the next one automatically? I probably might. If I play it multiplayer, I might put that on. Let's see. Single player quick combat movement, and multiplayer quick combat and movement. So it's the same thing, but single versus multi. Um, the, during one, between one turn and the next turn, stuff happens. Uh, and do you want animations for that stuff, in other words? Or... If you played Fire Emblem, you know about this. When you have two units fight, a little animation comes up showing them fighting. Um, or, if you have this checked, there's no animation, and it just goes, Oh look, you dealt 5 damage, the other person dealt 10. Good job. Uh, same for movement. It's, do you want to see them walking and flying somewhere, or do you just want to see them move? Um, same thing for multiplayer, so there you go. Let's see, I've left them off for the most part, and there's actually an in-game option to... Like, the entire option menu exists in-game. So, let's look at interface. Interface options, alternate cursor zoom mode. Um, this is just, do you want it to center on the center of the screen, or do you want it to center on the cursor when you're zooming in and out? Show all policy information. All policies will be displayed in the show some policy screen, blah, 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 blah. That's actually something that can be changed in the social policy screen, so putting it here is just, uh, is actually redundancy. Uh, I'll show you more about that later. Auto unit cycle. So, this Alpha Centauri does this, you know, once you've done something with unit over here, does it automatically go, oh, okay, you're done with that, go to the next one, or should it just do, 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 etc. Um, I, I prefer having auto cycle on, because otherwise I forget where all my units are. Single player score list, I display the simple score list in single player games, I probably don't care about that, but you might if you like watching scores. Uh, auto saves. And uh, binding mouse to the game window. If you're playing in window mode, do you want to have your mouse stuck in there? And you know, of course not. But it is a drop down. You know, drop down. So uh, auto saves, like I said, that you should be familiar with that. How often it does and how many are kept. That's good. If you want to, uh, you know, worry about a lot of backups, turn that number down. If you're ru running low on space or memory, you probably want to turn these up. Enable map inertia. So inertia from physics is the concept that. Uh, something that is at rest will stay at rest, and something moving will stay moving. In other words, when you start dragging the map, see my mouse has no inertia. As soon as I move the mouse, the, the thing moves. And if I let it go, it, it stops. Of course, it, it does have a little bit of inertia. It'll slide around on my, on my desk a bit, but uh, map inertia means that when you start dragging, you can drag and then kind of let go, and like, whoosh, the map will move for a moment, it'll slide. Uh, disabling that means that it just clicks and stops. Skip intro video. I should probably turn that on because I've seen it already. And if you haven't, then neener, neener, neener. Automatically size interface. That's a technical thing, as you can tell. Of course, it's a small game. Um, depends on your monitor. My monitor is a kind of crap one. And I think that having this is a good option. It automatically fits to my screen. Spoken language, not written language, spoken language, you'll see that English is the only one accepted at the moment, but if you have an international version, you probably have a different spoken language. Video options, um, so if you want to manually change your screen resolution, you can do that here. You'll see I've got a nice 1024 by 768. It's not 1080, uh, but it's close, kind of, sort of, kind of, sort of, sort of, kind of, whatever. Um, 60 hertz, that's because my monitor is good. But you could change the hertz and stuff. 
anti-aliasing on off, it's up to you, full screen, apply resolution, apply yada yada. I, to be honest, I never understood exactly what anti-aliasing did, um, but it, it's there, and uh, you know, V-Sync is also in here. High detail strategic view. So, strategic view is the better view, and I'll, I'll show you this when you get into the game. And of course, then there's the GPU decoding textures if you're worried about your GPU, or if you want extra compressed, Rah! which I should probably be using. Uh, leader scene quality. As you notice, these do not have overlays. So, this is just various, you know, graphic quality options. You'll see a lot of mine are set to low, because it's, my computer's okay, but um, I only built it for $400, so I should probably, you know, upgrade my graphics card at some point. But just, even on this, I don't like the, like, it, it's just a little slow, um, the, the terrain. But you can change all of those options. And it, it still looks pretty good, even at its low settings now. Audio! Kind of limited here, but you've got music, which you can hear in the background, sound effects, ambiance. Yeah, speech. So, there you go. And they're all independent sliders, and of course, you're setting down below. Okay, so let's, um, I don't know if I changed anything, so I'll just hit accept. And let's get into world generation. So, when you set the, you can, uh, I've, I've played a couple games already, so this Play Now is a new game. I, I don't, I, they should say new game. This Play Now is terrible. But it's using the same settings, and it's just, oh, I just want to play. Which, of course, means that if you're not paying attention and you're just trying to get playing, you're going to be have five new games, and you really want to load up the game. Uh, scenarios and tutorial. If you're new to the series or Civ 5 in particular, you might want to look through the tutorial. It's pretty useful. But, you know, some people don't like those. I'm not going to go through the scenarios. I've never been a big fan of scenarios. I'd rather just, well, not in these games. There are some games where scenarios are great, but... Not these 4E games or stuff. Uh, load game will show when doing the gameplay section, so again, if you want to see that, go check it out. And setup game, which is what we're interested in right now, so let's look at setup. And you'll see there's like this simple version of setup, and then here's a button for advanced. There's also a move back, you just start with these settings, where you could randomize everything. And, um, yeah. So let's start here. This is your faction, or I should say your civilization complete with a historical picture of where they ruled, and uh, some nice things on the map. Mm -hmm. For those who are having trouble reading this, the red stuff is land, the, actually all of it is land, and the gray stuff is water. So there's, Rome, there's Italy right there. Uh, they connected these, but these are not actually connected. So neither is that. It's the sea, and they're, they're not actually connected. There's, there's Greeks, Greece over there, sorry. Um, we have Gaul, which is now known as France, and Spain, um, Iberia, back then, a little bit of Northern Africa, etc. So I'm playing as the Romans because I like the Romans. You'll see there are plenty of options. So let's look through these. Each one here has um, their little guys up here, the bonuses you get, as well as your color and symbol. And there's an edit, so if you want to you know, call yourself the Cheeseheads, you can go ahead and do that, see? You can call yourself, um, you know, Brett Lafar, Cheeseheads, Cheese, Cheesems. Uh, that has always existed, even in Alpha Centauri. You'll see that the Romans get uh, production bonuses for anything that exists in the capital, and they get two special units, the Ballista and the Legion. Now, these, the way special units work, for those who aren't familiar, is that these units will replace, but they are equivalent to, various generic units. So, the generic siege unit at the beginning of the game is the catapult, but instead of catapults, Romans get ballista, and ballista are slightly better than catapults, by one or two points. Um, and as well, there's also a swordsman unit, but instead of swordsmen, Romans get the legion, because that's what they have. So if we come in here, we can select random things, or we can start looking at the various civilizations that come unlocked. Alexander of Greece? which has extra influence over city-states. City-states are small, not civilizations, but just they're small city-states that exist. They're usually neutral, um, and you can win them to your side or make enemies with them. So Alexander is better at winning them to his side. Because the Greeks like city-states. You'll see that they got, they have companion cavalry and hoplites, 
in uh, to replace their. These are both early, early things. So these are their special units. I believe that's horsemen, and that replaces warriors. I think so. Or spearmen. Uh, Askia from Songhai. Africa, in other words, if you couldn't tell. Uh, re get extra gold when you're uh, getting barbarian encampments and pillaging cities. Land units gain the war canoe and amphibious promotions, and so they're better when they're crossing rivers. They get a special cavalry unit, and instead of another unit, they get a special building, the Mud Pyramid Mosque. I believe this replaces the shrine, but I'm not certain. I haven't played as that. Attila the Huns, the Scourge of Awe. Um, you get to raise cities at double speed. I don't know why you'd want to, but you can. Um, you can borrow a city name from other in-game civs, because, you know, you really like the name Rome or London. Go figure. Uh, you start with animal husbandry, and you get plus one production per pasture. Go figure. Uh, you start also, instead of getting the chariot archers, you get horse archers, which are mounted archers, as you can guess, and battering rams, which would probably replace... Mm, probably replacing the trebuchet, I'm not sure. But anyways, yeah, they're, they're siege units. They might even just be special siege units that don't replace anything. There's C uh, Caesar in Rome, which we've already discussed. Germany! Um, when you get barbarian units, you might, or when you defeat barbarian units, you might get them, you might get gold for them, and um, less for land unit maintenance, because they're very efficient to these are. They get the Lanch Connect and the Ponzo Tank. The Lanch Connect will replace pikemen and were a very effective pike force back in the ancient days. And the Ponzo Tanks, well, anyone who's a big war buddy guy person knows all about the Panzers. Boudica, the Celts, um, their special thing is Druidic lore, apparently. Plus one fate per city with adjacent unimproved forest, which explains a lot about my game. Bonus increases to plus two faith in cities with three or more adjacent unimproved forest tiles. So as long as you leave forests alone, the, Druidic, uh, the, the Druids and the Celts have a lot of faith, which explains a lot about my game, where they have a lot of faith going on. They get the Pictish warriors, which uh, are interesting because the Picts were Scottish, not Celtic. Um, well, they weren't Irish. I guess you could still call them Celtic, and, and the Romans probably did, which is where we get the word Celt anyways. And uh, they also get, I think that's pronounced Salid Hall. I'm not certain on that, so if you happen to speak Gaelic, let me know. And I don't know what the Salith Hall does. But Catherine, Russia, Catherine the Great. You get extra strategic or extra production from various strategic resources, and these specific things provide double, which is really nice actually. Russia always gets some nice benefits. Uh, they replace, I think they're replacing the uh, knights with Cossacks, and uh, they replace uh, armories with Krepost. Darius I, Persia. His golden ages last longer. And um, they, everyone gets bonus movement and combat strength. Golden ages happen once every so often, but they're pretty rare. So I don't know if that's a really good thing or not. I guess you'd have to take things that increase your chances of getting a golden age to play properly. You get the immortal, which people remember from 300, but you know they weren't really that big. They were just really powerful, and I think they replaced the warriors. And you also get Satrap's court. I'm not sure what that might replace, but uh, you know Persia was you know, court laws, things like that. Persia lasted for a while. Carthage! This came from the expansion. This was not the regular game. This is part of the expansion. Uh, Dido. All coastal cities get a free harbor, which is nice. Units may cross mountains after the first great general is earned, but they take uh, some damage if they end turn on a mountain. And of course this happens because everyone's like, oh look, the Hannibal crossing the Alps. Brah. You also get African forest element for a unit. A and the Quinquireme. Oh, look at that. Triremes contain three decks. My guess is that the Quinquiremes contain ten. Oh, sorry, five. Win five. Anyways, Carthage. Elephants. Yeah. Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth I. Not the second. Not the current one. The first. England. Uh, sun Never Sets, which is ironic as Elizabeth came from the Renaissance era and the Sun Never Sets was Victorian era with Queen Victoria. Anyways, extra naval units and they get an extra spy, which. Longbowmen to replace archers, and ship of the line, 
for, uh, I think that replaces the, the frigates. So extra ships, extra archers, English archers are well renowned in their day, and I think they won the Battle of Magic or at least were helpful. Gandhi, of course, for India, he gets, um, if you have too many cities, then lots of extra unhappiness, but having lots of people is uh, not as bad. So having lots of cities is worse than normal, but having lots of people is not. So what you want is lots of people and few cities. He gets a war elephant, which I'm imagining is similar to the African forest elephant, and uh, a fort, Mughal fort. Genghis Khan from Mongolia. Mongolians! Combat strength plus 30% from fighting city-state units or attacking a city-state itself. If you like attacking city-states, you're pretty good doing it with the Mongols. All mounted units have plus one movement. In addition, you get the Keshik and the Khan. And uh, the Keshik appears to be archers, and I'm guessing the Khan is a melee unit, but they're both mounted, as you can see, because everyone knows they were good at doing that. Gustavus Adolphus from Sweden. I believe this is also included in an expansion pattern. Gain 90 influence with a great person gift to a city-state. Oh my goodness. So if you get rid of your great person to just give it away to a city-state, lots of influence. When declaring friendship, Sweden and their friend gains a 10% boost to great person generation. Oh, okay, so that helps. So when you're in Sweden's good at making friends and staying neutral. They get the Hekapalita? Hakapalita. I'm not sure if that's right or not. It looks apparently like a replacement for knights. And they also get the Karolaian. Which, that one sounds sweet, Swiss or German, and that one sounds French. I don't know anything about the Carolan, but my guess is he's a Three Musketeer type guy. Hail Selassie of Ethiopia. Combat bonus from fighting units from a civilization with more cities, so they're good at fighting bigger civilizations. Even so, Rome is too big for them, and why not? They get the Mahal Safari, which appears to be a type of musket men, and they also get the Steel, which is probably a replacement for the Monument early culture building. Harold Bluetooth, Denmark. Embarked units have plus one movement, so moving landing on to sea is uh, extra good for him. And he is uh, it's, it's easy to go back and forth. Melee units pay no movement point cost to pillage, so they're good at being Vikings. They get Berserkers and Norwegian Ski Infantry. Hmm. Interesting. Harun Ar Rashid from Arabia. Just, just Arabia in general. Plus one gold from trade routes and oil resources provide double quantity. Not to speak for itself, they get camel archers and the bazaar. So these will replace chariot archers, I think. And uh, the bazaar is uh, bazaar. Aha. Hiawatha, the Iroquois. Units move through forest and jungle in a friendly territory as if it were road, and those tiles can be used to establish trade routes upon researching the wheel. So even if you don't have roads, you can still establish trade routes through a uh, forest of jungle since it counts as if it was a pro. They get the Mohawk Warrior and the Longhouse. This is an early game unit, so I'm not sure how effective they'll be late game. Isabella from Spain. Gold bonus for discovering a natural wonder. Um, you also get extra culture, happiness, and tower rewards from natural wonders because, you know, they discover lots of silver in South, Af South America. They get a Tercio and a Conquistador. Both look like they're melee units, and uh, they look medieval to renaissance era, so mid-game. Kamehameha. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. That's kind of weird. Polynesia. Um, that, that might just be Kamehameha. Oh, that sounds better. Kamehameha. Oh, great. I don't know if people are going to be, like, pointing fingers at me. I think, again, this is an expansion uh, civilization. Can embark and move over oceans immediately without any sort of need for anything else. They were, you know, they were great at doing that. Plus one sight when embarked, and uh, if they're within space of this, they get extra, these little statues, they get extra bonuses. They also get a Maori warrior, which is another early game unit. Kamehameha. Maria Teresa, hmm. Austria. I think this is again an expansion civilization. Can spend gold to annex or puppet a city state that has been your ally for five turns. Interesting. Huh. That could be really handy. You can get a lot of extra cities that way without having to build settlers. Uh, Austria gets the Hussar, and also a coffee house. Hmm, not what I would have given Austria. I would have given Austria, I don't know, maybe like an opera house, but nope, they do coffee. Hmm. Montezuma, the Aztecs. You gain culture for the Empire for each enemy killed, which is really cool if you kill lots of enemies. They get Jaguars and Floating Gardens. Again, an early game unit. Napoleon, France. 
plus two culture per turn from cities before discovering steam power. So uh, don't discover steam power and you get lots of extra culture. Ancien Regime. They get the Foreign Legion and the Musketeer, which apparently is not the same as the Caroline, so I don't know what the Caroline is. Uh, Mid-game units. And this bonus is really good until you hit mid to late game, so good luck then. Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Babylon. I think this might also be expansion, I'm not sure. Receive free of great science when you discover writing. Earn great science is 50% faster, woohoo! Bowman and Walls of Babylon. So these are going to be um, pretty early on. This great scientist when you discover writing. That's going to be really useful because writing is very early, very early tech. And uh, so you get lots of science. I should play this guy sometime and see just how the Walls of Babylon, which probably replace regular walls, and just how the Bowman works out. But I don't think that's going to be a, a big deal. Oda, Oda Nobunaga. I should try that again. Oda Nobunaga from Japan, which is different if you've played other civs. It used to be... Uh, Tokunaga. Units fight as though they were at full strength even when damaged, which is really good if you are a uh, warrior. They get Samurai, probably to replace Longswordmen, and they get the Zero, uh, one of their types of planes back from World War II. So, a good uh, units late for mid and late game, and this is good in all game if you like fighting. Pakal, or Pasal, the Maya. After researching theology, which is a mid-game tech, receive a bonus great person at the end of every long count calendar set, every 394 years. I see. Interesting. They get the Atlatlist and the Pyramid. Hmm. Early unit. I don't know what that's going to do for you. And um, Pachacuti. I think that's right. The Inca. Uh, units ignore terrain costs moving into tiles with hills. Hmm. No maintenance costs for improvements in hills. Half cost elsewhere. Oh, that's pretty good. That means you could build roads pretty easily, which is ironic, because... Well, not ironic. I guess they were pretty good at roads, too. Them and the Romans, they built lots of roads. They get slingers for early game, and a terrace farm. Oh, okay. That's, I thought the Mongolians might get that, because they did a lot of that as well. But it makes sense that they would do that. They're in the Andes Mountains. Ramses II from Egypt. Uh, you get extra production towards wonders. There you go. Uh, they get chariots and a burial tomb. I don't know what the burial tomb does for you at all, but chariots look like uh, they've, there's a little archer on them, so that must replace the chariot archer. So that must be a better thing. From Siam, this guy, Ram Kung Hang, maybe, um, you get a lot of bonuses from city-states are increased, and he gets uh, Nareswan's elephant and the Wat, which is probably a replacement for the temple, that, I'm not sure as, I don't know what that's a replacement for, but it's something. Korea, which I believe is an expansion civilization, Sejong, plus two science for all specialists and all great person tile improvements. Interesting. Receive a tech boost each time a scientific building or wonder is built in the capital. So there we go. That's pretty good. They get the turtle ship and the Huacha, which uh, the Mythbusters tested, where it's kind of like a auto-fire rocket something. Go look it up. It's probably a pretty good unit, but they look like they're mid-early. Suleiman from the Ottomans. All in melee naval units have the promotion prize ships, allowing them to capture defeated ships. That's good. Uh, pay only one-third the usual cost for naval unit maintenance. Hmm. Sexy. I think. Probably. Uh, they get the Janissary and Sipai, Sipahi, sorry, the Sipahi, which look like the mounted units and the Janissaries here early musket, uh, the muskets, musket men. So that, that's interesting if you're a naval person. Theodora from Byzantium, Patriarchate of Constantinople, which is interesting because it's the same geographical location as the Ottomans. It's just earlier. But you get extra beliefs when you found religions. You also get cataphracts and dromons. And there's the uh, cross of the Orthodox Church. That's actually an honor symbol. Washington, because, you know, I have to be Washington. For America, um, all land military units get uh, extra sight and 50% uh, discounts when buying land. Because, yeah, that's what we do. That's pretty good, though. It lets you expand faster. Um, I don't know why this is like... I guess they just didn't want to be nationalistic. But anyways, we get Minutemen, which are probably replacing Musketeers. Here's the musket men. And the B-17 bomber, which is going to replace one of the other bombers. So mid to late game. William, the Netherlands. 
Dutch East India Company. You get extra happiness from a luxury resource if the last copy of it is traded away. So if you trade it away, you still get some happiness. It's, it's no big deal. Uh, they get a boat called the Sea Beggar, and they also get polders, which appear to be a giant windmills. I'm not sure what they do for you. Finally, there's Wu Zhexian, which is China. And uh, if you get a great general, his combat bonus is increased, and the spawn rate is increased by 50% as well. So another militaristic uh, civilization. They get the Cho no Ku. I, they look like he's got a bow there, so I'm going to assume he's a ranged unit. And Paper Maker. I don't know what that's going to do for you. So, there you go. There's all the civilizations. I might edit this. Map type. Continents. What type of map do you want? Continents. Pangea. Um, I just started on the continent world, and... Okay, so you, there are plenty of things here. Fractals, which are kind of uh, interesting, and I, I'd like to play that at some point. Earth uh, probably has a standard map size. Fractal and continent are what I would recommend for you, unless you really like land or you really like sea. Um, map size, this not only affects how many players there are, but the physical size of the map as well. Um, the problem is that in Alpha Centauri, for example, there are seven players and the map size is variable. Here, if you just do this, uh, difficulty level, oh look, only the best players in the world would beat this level. Uh, I don't think that's me. I'm currently playing on Warlord, or am I playing on Prince? I don't know. Some things have, um, I don't know. I think this changed in the expansion. No. And game pace, which is most important. Uh, Civilization pay, plays much quicker than Alpha Centauri. Much quicker. So if you want something like Alpha Centauri, either play an earlier version of Civilization, like Civ 2, or change your into uh, change your thing up to Epic or Marathon. Notice that it says uh, extremely long game speed, almost an entire normal game's worth of turns for each era, which indicates to me that Sam in mid late game, well, sorry late mid game, and I've gone through about. 175 turns so if there's 300 turns in a game and there's about five or six eras you're looking at a long game which is good i think if you, if you like it on the other hand if um you know you're just casual if you want to test out different setups you want to do quick and so let's look at the advanced setup because that's actually pretty important here you can pick your civilization and uh, give yourself a different team and stuff and as usual. Um, but you can also select other civilizations. So you can select the um, who they are if you really, really, really want to fight instead of the Huns and you don't care about anyone else. There you go. You have to have at least one other person, but it's not so on. Um, there is this team setting, so we could make them on your team, which is pretty interesting. I don't know how that one's going to play out. Um, but let's say you want lots of city states have lots or very few city-states, going down to none, you can change the uh, all the settings from earlier, can be changed in here, including, most importantly, the standard. So if you want a really big one, but you don't want 12 civilizations taking up space, you can delete it down, and there we go. There's your Alpha Centauri-style game, where you have seven factions on a really big world. And, of course, then you could customize this. And it doesn't change the physical map size, because that's a separate variable. It's just that it's linked to those things by default, but in this advanced setup, you can change that. Difficulty level, etc. Most, um, game era, so this is just where you start. I, I know I would have said five, there's actually a lot more than five eras. World age. I don't know what this does for you, but I have a guess. An earlier world age is going to mean you have less oil and more radiation. Radiation, So oil resources, smaller. Um, I don't know how that's going to affect luxury resources, but you know you might not see the same plant ones, you might see more mineral ones. At 5 billion years, so currently Earth is at 4.5 billion years old. So we're in between here. Um, if you take the 5 billion years, you'll probably see a less radiation, maybe fewer minerals, but maybe more plants, maybe, and probably more oil. I, I think that's the biggest thing. It might also affect hills and mountains. 
uh, an older Earth should have fewer of those. Temperature. Um, this affects grasslands versus tundra and desert. So hot is going to have more desert, more tropics, um, probably more grasslands, no tundra. T temperate is a mix. Cool will have a lot more tundra and ice. Maybe a desert. Some grasslands and forests. Rainfall, um, I guess, also affects grasslands and forests versus desert, but does not affect the tundra tropics. So if you wanted, for example, you can make it arid and cold, and everything would be like tundra. Uh, or you can make it hot and wet, and everything would be tropical and oasis, like with uh, some plenty of forests and rainforests and jungle, lots of jungle around. Sea level, that's just, like, you, if you want continents and you want low sea level, then you get big continents. Uh, and resources, legendary start. Everyone starts really well, and after that, standard strategic balance, etc., etc., etc. But most importantly, are these options down here. This video is almost done, there, folks. Victory types, how do you want to win? Win by nobody else wins, so you kind of win by default. Um, or achieve one of these very specific victories, which I'll talk about in the gameplay video. Advanced game options, uh, max turn, if you want a max turn thing, which is the time victory. Uh, policy saving. Um, when you, it's time to pick up a new policy, when it's time to pick up a promotion, or uh, do research, I, that should be somewhere. Uh, do you want to have to do it right away, or save it for later? Maybe you want to wait on it. I would recommend keeping these uh, selected, because otherwise, it's more challenging otherwise, but meh. Nah. Complete kills. In order to be eliminated from the game, players must have all cities and units destroyed. It's debatable about whether you want this or not. It's probably more important in, in multiplayer games. Disable start bias. Um, if, with this off, then civilizations start where they would be good. They get good starts. With this on, you might start in a place that's good for you. You might not. Uh, turn timer. Challenge option. Random seed. Um, that means... So there you go. If you attack after loading, you might get a different result from the first time. So basically, this... With this selected, it means that you could um, save something and attack somebody and something happened. Or you, and you go, I don't like that outcome. You save and attack again, maybe it's a little different. Um, well, you don't save, you just reload. No Ancient Ruins, uh, no Barbarians. That's just going to make it easier, so... Ancient Ruins are... Eh, they're, they're a thing. They're kind of like the data pods from Alpha Centauri. No Sitting Raising. I don't know why I don't have that checked. I don't like the idea of raising your cities anyways. Um, and it's an extra button that you might run into. No espionage, um, which actually that's probably a good thing to have. I looked it in there just to see what it's like. I think it might be an expansion thing. I'm not sure on that. Uh, let's see, one city challenge. Human players are only ever allowed to build or own one city. Hmm. Quick combat and quick movement. We've addressed those options earlier. Raging barbarians makes it more challenging, and random personalities means that you're not going to be, you know, Rome will always do the same thing. So, there you go. And of course, if you want, you can add players here, you can reset everything back to defaults. And then you can start your game. So, there you go, you can customize everything about your game, or leave it completely out. It's all up to you. When you do start, a little guy will appear that will read off a standard little spiel about your dude, and uh, that'll be that. So, thanks for watching the options and setup video. I know it's kind of long, kind of boring, but that's why it's a separate video. If, at this point, you're still interested in the game and you'd like, then uh, head on over, I'll put a link up, head on over to the gameplay video. Or you can go see my thoughts. Alright, and until next time, don't catch on fire.